this time we're taking a look at the space travel slash horror film sunshine and along the way we ask why does danny boyle love shaking the camera so much is this an allegory for climate change or religious extremism and how can seven dead people create so much dust we have an excess of podcasts on this edition of force fed sci-fi Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Force Fed Sci Fi Podcast. I am one of your hosts, Chris Rupp, and I am joined by my friend and co host, the dusty Sean Michael Colt. I really hope you're not actually dusty because <laughs> then that means you produce about like six feet worth of just dead skin and bone matter, apparently. <laughs> yeah. No, no, I hope I'm not dusty. I might be ashy, though. <laughs> Well, then you should probably use some lotion for that. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. Amen to that. It puts brother. the lotion in the basket. Puts the lotion on the skin. <laughs> so, yes, welcome back, everybody. We're talking about the 2007 film from Danny Boyle, Sunshine. And I had actually uh, never seen this before, uh before today's episode and i was pretty excited to check this one off the list at first uh you and me both chris you and me both (laughs) all right so let's provide a quick synopsis of sunshine so in the year 2057 the sun is dying and an international team of astronauts are carrying what is known as a stellar bomb it's the largest explosive device ever created and they plan to drop it into the star our sun, in the hopes of restarting it. I don't know how how that works, but they that's their plan. For when the mission encounters unexpected difficulties, they must decide if an individual life can be weighed against the entirety of humanity. Ooh. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. I mean, I feel like that's true of a lot of pretty much every, you know, life or death suit mission that goes into space, either... Like everybody dies or one person sacrifices themselves to save everybody. Yeah, I would say so. Especially in the movie world. It can never be easy, Chris. It's never easy. No, never easy. I mean, Bruce Willis just made his sacrifice look so easy in Armageddon. (laughs) I forgot about that movie. Yeah, right? I mean, just just giving it up, man, for the other guy. No, he he definitely uh, made, what was it, Ben Affleck? feel that man has like serious trauma for the rest of his life because of that yeah you watch the only the thing you the closest thing you have to a father figure push you back in an elevator (laughs) and tell you to take care of his daughter and go marry her like oh okay come on (laughs) this is this is too much i feel good about my life now All right, so let's get into who actually made and starred in this movie. And as we mentioned, it's directed by Danny Boyle. And before before getting his feet wet into science fiction, he had directed uh, Train Spotting and 28 Days Later. And he had really kind of gained this big international claim following those two films. I remember Train Spotting being very well received back in the day and really 28 days later kind of was this hybrid of horror science fiction and not exactly a found footage film, but definitely kind of like a pioneer of this grainy, almost handheld digital style filming. I'm definitely going to back that up with you. I, he also did a slum dog millionaire too. I don't know. Did you say that? (laughs) (laughs) That I did not. Uh, I didn't say that one. He did that one after Sunshine. So he kind of pivoted real quick from dark science fiction into this bright human interest story. Yeah, because after that, he did Slumdog. He did 128 hours with uh, or 127 hours with the Franco. And then uh, I know he did that Steve Jobs movie because the one with Ashton Kutcher, no one liked so so Danny Boyle was like, I'll make a better one. You will all love it. 
Yeah, and while that one was better, I think purists of Steve Jobs hated it. But <laughs> I mean, you know, I don't think any like pure Steve Job fanboy or whoever is going to be happy with any sort of movie they make about him. No, they worship the ground that he walked. Right. They 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 get out the ancient ruins of old Macintosh computers and try to su- and bring out their turtlenecks to try and summon the spirit of Steve. <laughs> you know, but they still made the phones without it. You know, so that's all I'm gonna say. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Interesting enough to note, though, Boyle partnered with Alex Garland, who we have previously talked on about on this show when we discussed Dread. He actually wrote this film he wrote sunshine as well as 28 days later so he has this past working relationship with garland that really kind of carries them through several films okay i didn't know that that's some good uh that's some good uh what is that fun facts yeah some uh, some nuggets to kind of keep in mind as we uh, go forward talking about the movie and then getting into the cast we have um killian murphy as robert kappa and this was after he had appeared in Batman Begins. So he was becoming more and more known to American audiences. He he was, though I do have to say, this film, like upon seeing his face on the screen all the time, I just felt that he, he's a weird looking guy, man. <laughs> I just saw him all the time and I'm like, that's why you're you're not always on the screen for the big movies. <laughs> it's just, I can't take too much of him. I'm sorry. I mean, either the actors have gotten weirder looking or our standards for a leading man have just gone down. I don't know which which is more true. I don't know. I don't know. I just or maybe it's just like his face and his voice, because it just seems like he always speaks so monotone. But maybe it's his eyes that are so dreamy. That's why they have him. (laughs) But I digress. Yeah, you can argue that, I mean, he's better off as a bit player, but I mean, you can't deny that he finds his way into great projects every couple of years. And but I mean, this was this was the beginning of, you know, him getting more recognized. So you take what you can get. I mean, and then in that's yeah, in that same vein, we also have Chris Evans as Mace. And this was before he was cast as Captain America. So he was still very lanky and he had the spindly arms and <laughs> nobody had really kind of recognized just how good of an actor he could have become. Michelle Yao as Corazon. She's the biologist and she had actually appeared uh as a Bond woman in Tomorrow Never Dies. And okay. from what I understand, she was pretty much given carte blanche for any role she wanted. Like, I guess she had just nailed her audition and Danny Boyle just said, take whatever role you want. It does not matter. <laughs> All right. We, what, who else we got in this? We got Cliff Curtis. I just saw him in the yeah. uh, Doctor Sleep. I believe he was in that. He's a good actor. Yeah, I mean, and before this, I mean, I had only known him um, as Smiley, one of the 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 Latin gangsters in uh, in Training Day that that threatened to the murder Ethan Hawke in the bathtub, but uh, yeah, he he was actually starting to kind of gain more traction around this time because he appeared in the um, in the Die Hard in the Die Hard Four, which came out in the same year in two thousand seven, and then he's just become more and more involved in a lot of projects. You mentioned Doctor Sleep. <clears throat> I know he was on the uh, one of the Walking Dead spinoffs for a few years, so I mean he's, I mean his career has just grown leaps and bounds after this film. Oh hell yeah! You know whose career has also grown leaps and bounds? Uh, are you gonna say Benedict Wong? Yes, that was what I was gonna say, especially due to the uh, <laughs> Marvel Cinematic Universe. We've also got um, Hiroki uh, Sanada, who plays um, Kaneda, the first uh, um, captain on the Icarus Two. And his big breakthrough, at least for American audiences, was when he appeared in The Last Samurai, which is low-key one of the most underrated films of the 21st century, in my opinion. Really? We're going to bring up The Last Samurai? (laughs) That's awesome. How many people do... That movie is so good, and yet hardly anybody talks about it. No, no, I agree. I saw the film after it came out. It it was great, man. It was a great moment of my uh, middle school life. Tom Cruise was great in that uh, dressed up as a samurai chopping people up. And then rounding out the rest of the cast, we have Troy Garrity as Harvey. And if that name isn't familiar, um, if you've ever seen the barbershop films, he was the only white guy and he was constantly made fun of for being the only white guy (laughs) who worked in the barbershop. (laughs) 
Very. And then finally, we get Mark Strong as Pinbacker, yeah. the um, the religious zealot who uh, became the crispy horror specter in the last act of the film. <laughs> crispy, indeed. That is a good word to describe him. Uh, so let's talk about how did this film come to be? Yeah, so it was budgeted at forty million dollars, which. I mean, it does sound like a lot, but really in this day and age, it's really more, that's about as much as like a studio is willing to commit to a small science fiction role, um, film, excuse me. And this was set at 20th Century Fox, but they passed on it, but then gave it to Fox Searchlight, which handles all the indie film that's indie films that Fox doesn't want to do. And since Danny Boyle had this clout behind him after having made 28 Days Later, they gave him more money and they gave him more freedom to do what he wanted with uh, Sunshine. Hmm. And I was looking at what Boyle made these actors do to get them ready for this role and their roles. And it is insane. This is like more homework than anybody should ever have to do for a movie. It is nuts. I mean, he made the, he made them all live together <laughs> since the crew on the Icarus 2 would have been living together for about a year and a half when the movie starts. Oh, my God. He enrolled them. Not done. There's a lot more. <laughs> enrolled them in space training as well as scuba classes to kind of get them used to a, you know, an isolate, working in an isolated environment and just knowing what to do if something goes wrong in a situation like that. Also had them watch the right stuff. The... The astronaut, uh, the NASA film about the Mercury and Gemini pilots. They toured a nuclear submarine to provide them a sense of claustrophobia. Took them up in a vomit comet, which flies in a parabolic arc to simulate weightlessness. And it's also how astronauts train. Rode on a Boeing 747 flight simulator. (laughs) It's just getting insane. And the last thing he had to do was made them read Moon Dust, which is a collection of stories from men who have walked on the moon. So this is all geared towards a learning isolation, getting used to claustrophobia and getting used to what life is like in space. All right. That's not too bad. I mean, it's not too bad, but it's all geared towards method acting, which really I mean, I don't know how you feel about method (laughs) acting, but I really kind of feel like. It kind of hinders an actor's natural talents and makes them more sort of rely on other things to just say like, well, I know I'm my character's in this situation, so I'm going to do it like that, you know? Yeah, I, uh, <laughs> I, I don't know, like, the method. I guess maybe it helped the film a little bit, kind of, maybe. <laughs> I mean, I didn't see too much, like, I was never... I didn't watch it while watching this film. I wasn't like, oh, my God, this is so el natural with how they're operating as astronauts. If anything, I was kind of mad about some scenes like we talked about how it felt like once the guys started dying, they're like, oh, crap, we don't know how to uh, we can't. There's no, you know. We can't plant flowers anymore. We don't know how to make oxygen in the in the space station anymore because the lady died. You know, the pilot dies. Oh, we're screwed. We can't fly anymore. So, I mean, I feel like he spent so much time training them to be comfortable in the environment, but like the writing didn't really pay off with how I feel like real astronauts perform in space. Yeah, that's one of the things that kind of gets glossed over when we watch astronaut films is all members of the crew are real are cross trained with somebody else's duties. So in case something were to happen to a crew member where they wind up incapacitated, there is somebody else who's able to take over their job as well as perform their tasks. So yeah. That was the first thing I noticed when everybody starts dying and they're all freaking out. Well, who's going to do this? Who's going to do that? Like, you all should be trained on how to do each other's jobs. Right? I mean, shoot. They wanted to kill Benedict Wong, who, like, he's the character that does the math for, like, them getting, sending the packages, flying to and from Earth. And I'm like, wait, you're going to kill the one guy that does all the numbers? Yeah, and you mean to tell me that there isn't anybody else on board who's capable of doing the math that Benedict Wong can do? Or, I mean, they're all astronauts. They should all be able to do this in their sleep. Exactly. No, Chris, the film is racist. 
Of course, the Asian man is the math nerd. <laughs> Why would it be, you know? <laughs> the white man's the pilot, of course. <laughs> I mean, there is something to be said about the film being mildly racist, because I guess the producers told all the actors that they had to try and speak in American accents to make the film more marketable. Oh, my God. But didn't he cast primarily Americans and Asians because he felt like the Chinese and us of like 50 years would like be? Well, there's um, uh, well, Killian Murphy is British and Rose Byrne is also british um benedict one i mean he's british and asian so i guess he checks both boxes mark strong is british i mean mean, it's a pretty decently i mean it is it's a british american and of course asian cast but um i guess yeah you were right they're going they were trying to go for american and chinese space agencies because they feel like they felt like that those two would be the most advanced by the mid-21st century and I thought, like, aren't they aren't they already the most advanced space agencies? <laughs> like, is something else going to happen in the next 30 years that we don't know about and cause us to kind of take a step back in space exploration? Yeah, you didn't know, Chris. India is catching up to us, man. A- Africa's got a huge space station that they're about to launch up into the sky. Speaking of that, where were the black people of this film? None. They have every freaking race but black people. No, yeah, I mean, there is definitely some sand in, in the argument that this film is mildly racist. So. <laughs> or maybe the black people were on Icarus 1. They all got burned alive because, right, that that's how every horror film goes. The black guy dies first. Which is somehow worse because not only are they not in the film at all, they're already dead. <laughs> the Danny Boyle, the damn British man. Super racist. <laughs> well... And the big point of this film is Icarus 2 is the second in this mission to try and restart the sun. And we hear it all throughout the film. It's reinforcing us. The sun is dying. The sun is dying. And even though this is happening, the film takes place in 2050 around that time. The sun dying isn't set to happen for about another 5 billion years. Yeah. It's it's not. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, we're going to have the sun for a long time. Yeah, and I was just kind of confused because I did some research for how a sun dies and, like, what happens. We wouldn't be, like, flying a spaceship close to the sun to, like, collect its heat and send it to Earth. Because I know the film said that Earth was cooling, right? It was getting colder. Right. That's That was the big thing that they were talking about was the sun's dying, therefore the Earth is getting less and less heat. But that's actually, like, not what happens. Not to be, like, science, but... We are a force-fed sci-fi podcast. So apparently, I don't know if you know, but when the sun like dies, quote unquote dies, it actually like collapses into itself and turns into a red giant. Every billion years, basically the sun's luminosity gets 10% brighter, warmer, and just continues to expand outward. So in five to six billion years, the sun is actually going to be so bright and so warm that it's actually going to cook the earth. (laughs) <laughs> and it's going to absorb all of our hydrogen and we will become either basically like Venus. We'll just become like this rock of desolate wasteland. So it's not, no, we would not, we would not become colder. We'd actually get very freaking hot and melt. Yeah. When the, when the sun does burn through all its hydrogen and becomes a red giant, I mean, that's going to envelop all of the inner planets, including yes. Earth. <laughs> so, I mean, we're not going to have anything to worry about because the Earth is just going to be gone. going to be gone. <laughs> We won't be here. And even after that happens, the sun is going to continue burning for another billion years. So hopefully by then we'll have figured out a way to get to a new habitable planet or something just so we can get out of the path of our giant freaking sun about to kill us. Right. (laughs) Because it keeps pushing the habitable boundary like farther, farther out because we're safe now with our ozone. And I think they call it the greenhouse effect that regulates our temperature. But yeah, as it gets war- as it dies, it just keeps getting hotter. So, no, this film science was wrong. It just reminds me of Futurama when the Earth is warming up, and they're blaming these green. They're blaming all the excess greenhouse emissions on the the robots that are burping methane. <laughs> and their solution at first is to nuke all the robots on one island. Yes. But they figure out, oh, it's just easier to move the Earth a tiny bit so our week is a bit longer and we're away from the Earth. <laughs> Dude, that episode is so freaking great. Uh, 
Futurama, man. Check it out if you've never watched it. <laughs> oh man, and it's just uh I mean, and we've kind of we've briefly talked about this too. I mean, and how astronaut crews are kind of, you know, formed. And I really I think an underrated aspect of space films in general is featuring astronauts with different personalities and there are many NASA psychologists that say you need a mixture of individuals who will get along well and won't fight or jeopardize the mission if they freak out. And that's why vetting astronauts takes such a long time to do, because you need that mixture of the right stuff, as they call it. Yes, you would not get astronauts that group together and say, let's kill Benedict Wong. And then upon finding Benedict Wong, he's already done the job himself. No. <laughs> Yeah, but my issue, too, is, again, uh, besides the fact that nobody is cross-trained to do each other's job, who was the physicist on Icarus 1 if Kappa was the person who designed the bomb? Because they make this big deal that Kappa designed the bomb, and I'm the only person who knows how it works, and I can turn it on, and blah, blah, blah. It's like, well, who was the person that did that in the first one? What was their plan there? (laughs) I don't know, man. My size are enough to give it away. I don't freaking know. I thought it was him and Canada or something. They were the only two that knew it or figured it out or something. But then Canada dies. It's just there's when you really kind of analyze like, oh, well, this crew is this person on the crew is there. But where were they on Icarus one It's like you can explode your mind trying to figure out like who was who on the other ship. (sighs) It's, I don't know. (laughs) The choices that they make and like the logic behind the writing with this film, as we'll discuss more, just a lot of times doesn't really line up. It's good spectacle, though. I will say great spectacle for 2007, like when they're climbing out uh, Kappa and Canada to like fix the panels. I mean, I was pretty blown away by that golden space shoot. I mean, it was Funkalicious, if you ask me. Like something from the 70s, baby. (laughs) (laughs) It was blowing my mind. I am surprised at that scene, though, that Kaneda volunteered to go out with Kappa and fix the panels. And and because Kaneda is the first person on the crew who is killed in the film when he's not able to get back to the hatch in time and the sun kind of envelops him. But how did you feel about Kaneda as the leader of the ship at first? Uh... I thought it was great with him as the leader, but I knew I just had this really sickening feeling that once they said, oh, no, the panels are broken. And then when the captain always announces that he's going to go out, it's not like Star Trek. It's never like Star Trek. (laughs) I was like, he's going to die because he's not on the poster. And so when he went out and died, I was just like, sigh, it's going to be a murder fest, I feel like. Or it's going to be an indie film where it's like a psychological thra- trauma and all that. And uh, I was pretty, it swung me for a bit where it felt like a psychological trauma. Yeah, him dying was really kind of the catalyst for Everything. a lot of the other tension that just sunk the crew for the rest of the film. Because you see Trey go into this big depression and he's forced to isolate and medical and you see Searle kind of taking a nosedive and Corazon as well, like kind of analyzing the, the math of it. And then Harvey just like, well, I guess I'm the leader now. Yeah, <laughs> I'm going to do whatever now. I'm the boss. I'm the boss. He, Harvey's like the supervisor that just became a supervisor and has to remind you that they're the supervisor every single day. Yeah, I. to be fair, though, I felt so bad for Harvey when he died, though. Oh, it was so sad for him. <laughs> he was freaking out. I mean, I don't know if it was sad. I mean, I just felt sympathetic towards him because nobody took him seriously as the captain after after Canada dies. Yeah. And then when he does die, they're like, oh, no, we lost Harvey. Okay, let's just go in the hatch now. <laughs> and he died. He has this laughable suggestion when the coupling is broken, when they dock with Icarus One, it's like, oh, we'll go, but we'll come back and get you. Like, how? <laughs> it's like I couldn't help but laugh at him. Like, no, did you just? There's catastrophic damage to this coupling. How are you going to go back and get them? It's a one way trip, baby. And I think, yeah, I don't know. I think that like Icarus One and that whole journey was a good way to like write off characters that weren't really 
developed, you know, or that weren't because the movie was it spent a lot of time developing. But then once they made it take us uh, one and the catastrophe happened, they had to, like, get back to the ship and, like, continue with the conflict. So that was just a way to get rid of Harvey, because I don't know what he would have done if he would have made it back to the ship. He probably would have made it worse. So instead, they let him go flying off into space, where his face freezes and turns into like snowflakes. Yeah, and <laughs> yeah, it, it, we see this a lot too in um, some space films where somebody gets sucked out into the vacuum of space and then they instantly turn to ice. And as morbid as it sounds, it actually got me curious as to what actually happens if you get sucked out into space. All right. So it turns out you can actually survive, not for too long, if you find yourself out in space, but you have to be rescued right away. The first thing you got to do is you have to exhale since your lungs could explode if you hold your breath because it's the pressure differential in your bodies versus the vacuum of space. Oh, my God. You also get a, nas- you also get a nasty sunburn from just the unfiltered cosmic radiation. And you wouldn't actually freeze right away either since your body heat doesn't leave that quickly. These things will happen over time the longer you're out into space, but... The max you could probably survive out in space is maybe like 30 seconds to a minute. And that's if you're not killed by the cosmic radiation or, you know, a space object hits you and just obliterates your body. Oh, my God. (laughs) That's terrible, man. Yeah, I am. We are not recommending anybody go and try this. We're just saying, like, it is possible albeit very slim for you to survive in the vacuum of space for a very short period of time (laughs) you just have to follow these steps and pray to god you get rescued oh god well at least now i know why sandra bullock was so mad in gravity (laughs) you know when george clooney came in the pot it all makes sense so now look that makes sense now you know you can open the door real quick but you just can't hang out there with the windows down no, it's it's not like going for a Sunday drive. You like, okay? We got you. Close the doors now. <laughs> Let's let a breeze in. Oh Jesus Christ! Oh, so- I just I also I just found that whole sequence there when the coupling breaks from Icarus too, and and their their solution is to rip the paneling off the inside of the wall, cover themselves with it, and then just throw themselves <laughs> at the hatch, and hopefully they land inside Icarus too. It was just that's where. I don't know for you, but that's that for me was when the movie just kind of took this insane leap into the ether of the implausible. Crazy land? Crazy town, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, I, I definitely. That was it. That was it for me, actually, too. I, uh, yeah, seeing them jump as cool as it looked, I was like, this is it. We're going no way. We're, we're going down a road and we're not coming back from here. Yeah, because from there, the film makes this ultra weird pivot into horror and suspense because somehow when the two Icaruses are coupled together pinbacker who is somehow still alive after all this time manages to sneak over to icarus 2 destroy the coupling and proceeds to terrorize and murder the the crew of Ic- what remains of the crew of icarus 2 yep and i guess this film is about climate change and religious extremism, maybe, or maybe, <laughs> maybe Pinbacker is the representation of Mother Nature <laughs> on humans. I don't know, man. Well, I mean, Pinbacker makes these references. I mean, he sees he asks Kappa when he meets him, you know, are you an angel? Mm-hmm. And you, I mean, and then watching his video journals, he makes a lot of religious references. So I think. Pinbacker is sort of this this figure for religious extremism. Like, well, it's in God's plan for the Earth and the universe to die. Therefore, we should let it happen, and we shouldn't do anything to delay that. Meanwhile, well, and meanwhile too, we see Kappa and everybody's like, well, we need to warm the Earth. You know, the cli- the climate is dying, and blah blah blah. And then at the very end of the film, we also see Sydney, Australia, which is normally a very dry and hot place covered in snow which is just insane and then on on the icarus on both of the ships we see this lush um forget what they call it they they call it an oxygen room oxygen garden or something right Mm -hmm. 
yeah, this just teeming with life and these plants to just feed off of oxygen. So it's it's like the Icarus is literally carrying the last vestige of a stable environment and it's carrying this life giving these life giving plants on board and yet they're just they're snuffed out because Pinbacker descends into madness. Yes. Yes, he does. And uh, that's when the movie just, I kind of like shut it off. <laughs> so I just couldn't do it. Uh, I, I I will admit, Chris, I did turn off the film once I saw Kevin or Benedict Wong's wrist slit open and Pinbacker. First and foremost, because I got scared because it was midnight and I didn't want to have nightmares. <laughs> And, you big baby. And secondly, because it was just going off the rails. So I did read what happens on Wikipedia and watch it later on uh, YouTube. But it was so bad. It just becomes a murder spree. It's just like a murder fest, man. Why? Yeah, I mean, you. I mean, you're, he gets Trey and then he stabs Corazon. And then he tries to go after Cassie. I mean, she manages to outsmart him, though, thankfully. And and but I mean, the only one he doesn't get is Mace, who sacrifices himself by dip diving into, um, I guess, the coolant for the server and, and freezes. freezes to death. Yeah. So we have Searle, who emulates himself, uh, emulates himself in the in the viewing room on Icarus one. And then we have somebody who freezes to death. Yes. You with get, Mace and Harvey. Yeah. So we have them. Oh, even Canada, too, is uh, immolated, too. So we, we get two people who die <laughs> by the sun murdering them. It's, and then we have two other people who are frozen to death. And then everybody else is stabbed or they bleed out or they're blown up by the stellar bomb. Yep. It's so poetic. Two by two. This is like Game of Thrones in space. It, it literally is. I did, though, I will say, I did hear... A reason for all right. So this is like we talked about this a little bit. Someone says that Pinbacker was never there; that it was actually like Fight Club; that Kappa was actually Pinbacker. That's why. And they say the big thing for what makes this a quote unquote psychological trauma is because Pinbacker is always digital. You never get a clear shot of him in the camera. It's always like a light shining, so uh, you never could see him. Right? It's always blurred or something and then at the end when cassie sees kappa after all the madness happens she doesn't like smile or anything like she looks afraid so some person on like reddit and on the washington post i think wrote an article saying that it's actually pinbacker was never there it was actually kappa and for me i don't <laughs> know how much sand i put into that theory it's <laughs> <laughs> uh, what what was the point? I mean, just to murder everyone and then commit suicide by touching the sun at the end. I, I don't know. I mean, their uh, their odds are already very slim of everybody surviving anyway. Yeah, and the addition of Pinbacker as this as this almost unstoppable religious <laughs> zealot that's killing everybody. It just it doesn't make a lot of sense for that final act, and and, and it's really where at this point. I mean where the film has gone off the rails and Pinbacker's killing everybody and what could have been a strength of the film and just continuing the exploration and the danger and the necessity of this mission just goes completely lost because we're now worrying about a crispy murder victim. Like it's pretty much like Freddy Krueger in space without the dream sequences, just killing everybody. Mm -hmm. And I, I thought, like the whole thing with like Benedict Wong's character, Trey was the package. It was like a miscalculation. So they went to like Icarus one to like find something to help with that, like the miscalculation and everything to get it back to earth. So I thought like, Oh, okay. So this the rest of the film. They're just going to be like trying to figure out a way to like save the earth, you know, get another package or whatever to there. But no, it just turns into this like murder fest, a horror movie from hell. It's like a what was that? Event Horizon. It's terrible. <laughs> so bad. I, I mean, I mean, jokes aside. I mean, when we're discussing, I mean, religious extremism versus climate change. I think 
the idea of making this mostly a space exploration film, at least for the first two thirds of it, mm-hmm. I think it really drives home the point of the the I don't want to say nobility, but I think the necessity of space exploration. And I do believe that that aspect, exploring space and discovering what we can about it, and not the militarization, is one of humanity's most important endeavors because there is an expiration date on this planet if we keep going down the road we're going with the efforts that we're not making into you know affect climate change and other aspects of of cultivating sustainable living on this planet we are going to have to find a means of getting off this planet and finding somewhere that's habitable and that mission will become necessary and yes people uniting behind the idea of space exploration, of breaking the bonds of Earth. It unites people. It inspires technological growth and innovation. And above all, it gives us hope. <laughs> I mean, people were people were hopeful in the 1960s when we landed on the moon. And we declared we come in peace for all mankind. And there's something there's something very comforting about that. That there was that there are that there are places beyond our Earth that we can look forward to to discovering and learning about. And we're currently trying to figure out a way to get to Mars. That's right. Mission to Mars, baby. Hopefully that does happen within our lifetime, because I think that would be the most amazing thing to see is a human being, regardless if they're American or whoever, landing on Mars. Oh, without a doubt. It's, uh, I mean, I always check on the online on the photos because you can actually see like all the robots that are on the robots on Mars right now, they take photos and it's really surreal to like, see, Oh my God, this is a planet up close. And we have the technology now to where the pictures are clear and crisp and can collect data. I think, I don't know if you were tracking this, but a couple of weeks ago, we got some samples from an asteroid and we're like flying it back to earth to like, you know, take some samples from like an asteroid. How cool is that, man? Space. Yeah, that's yeah. I read about that. It's it's a, an actual rover landed on an asteroid. I don't know if it was a rover, but it was a design. It was a device divine, designed to get samples from an asteroid mm-hmm. and send back to Earth. And like, that's just the coolest thing. That's something that's straight out of a science fiction film. We actually landed on an asteroid. Hell yeah! And all we need is to continue to progress further together and explore space and unite as mankind. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know. I think you're right, though. Definitely that uh, space exploration, that is the next step if we want to survive as a species. And and honestly, it's the only way that we can really come together to like beat climate change and progress. I, I am hopeful, though I do feel like we may knowing the United States commercialize it just like an ad Astra where the moon he has like a subway. That's like my biggest worries and fears, but I hope that uh, we can hopefully put it all behind us. Once we see climate change is real and unite as a species, you just kind of save it, you know? Hey, as long as I get to take, you know, something cool to the moon, something that's going to make the time pass by <laughs> books, movies, television shows, whatever, you know, it's it's one more luxury that the crew of Icarus 2 didn't get. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. Oh, man. So, what did you think about red shirts in this film? Were there any? You know, I mean, there are a lot to choose from because everybody dies. Mm, yes. But for my red shirt, I'm picking Trey. And for me, I can understand why he blames himself for the mission going belly up like it does. And I think I speak for all of us when we say we've been kind of stuck in this, that, that cognitive dissonance and binary thinking that, that, you know, it's like, Oh, this is all on me. I messed up. Therefore things have gone wrong. And I mean, I don't blame him for thinking like that because it's a natural thing to want to do in a situation like that. But following that he's relegated to just being sedated for most of the film until we see that he's killed himself. Yep. Poor Trey. <laughs> I, mean, it, I mean, is it possible that Pinbacker killed him and made it look like Trey killed himself to throw him off his scent? No. 
maybe so. but again it's it's that it's it's like trey had already been beating himself up so much and he was drugged out so i kind of put more credence to the fact that maybe he just killed himself because he could deal yeah. with what had happened well fair enough my uh what about you did you have a red shirt oh it's tough so i was between trey canada and harvey um I don't know. I felt Canada was like a useless sacrifice, like a stupid one, especially with the captain. But since you picked Trey, I'm going to pick Harvey. <laughs> I just feel bad for the guy. Like, I feel like his character never had a real good role. Like, he was the last one Danny Boyle wrote. And I just feel like he was killed because they didn't know what to do with his character. You know, they they made him so one-dimensional, like this guy who wasn't going to be a good leader as a plan B and was emotionally compromised and somewhat selfish in that one brief mo- pocket, you know, when they're trying to figure out how to come back. So they're like, well, we don't know what to do with him. So let's just float out into space. Cause that would be a cool depiction of him dying, <laughs> you know, free turning into a snowflake. <laughs> so I felt bad for him dying. And I, uh, I didn't think that his death, I felt his death could have had something more or had more development. So that's me. Yeah, I, I I'm with you. He was just so whiny, like, listen to me, I'm the captain now. And then <laughs> nope, just out into the vacuum you go, you're dead. Yeah. It was like, who is this man? Like where where did he come from the whole film? <laughs> He's just appearing now. <laughs> ah, say love you. Although speaking of things that seem uh not as fully formed, did you have a lens flare? A lens flare. So my lens flare Oh, man, that's tough. That's real tough. So my lens flare is either the is probably the dust people in Icarus one or uh, the guy that's obsessed with the sun with his like glasses and stuff like that just really bothered me. Him like staring at the sun and being obsessed with it. Like we get it. You worship the sun god for some reason. But just like the continuous cutbacks. I mean, it was just so set up. You like knew that he was going to fry himself and commit suicide for some freaking reason. So I just got annoyed. You know, I'm, I'm not going to go with any sort of specific character choice here, but what I'm going to go for is Danny Boyle's style of filmmaking. And what I like about Danny Boyle is that he's capable of making a film that, doesn't rely on any sort of like tricky cameras sometimes or shaky cam or things like that, but he doesn't lean fully into his, his oeuvre as a director until pinbacker arrives. And I can't stand how he decides to just shake the camera and distort the images of pinbacker. And I really, I don't know what he was trying to accomplish there by keeping him out of by keeping Pinbacker out of focus and impossible to discern when he's on camera. And it's also a big reason why I don't watch a lot of other Danny Boyle films is this the boilness of them at oftentimes. <laughs> and as soon as that happened, I was like, okay, I I almost turned it off when that started happening. <laughs> See, you were right there with me, man. God, I know. It's those angles. I mean, I would almost say uh, the Murphy, you know, his face was a lens flare in and of itself. The close ups and the eyes. It's just like, Jesus Christ. You just in the pinbacker. I agree with you, man. It's just maybe he's going for the ambiguous. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it. <sighs> We no- already know who he is. We've established that this is Pinbacker, so I don't understand the necessity of keeping him out of focus <laughs> for that for the last like half hour or however long he's terrorizing Icarus too. It's just to me, it just doesn't make sense. Especially when he's the antagonist, the the, the right. rushed antagonist that just shows up. Really, in a movie like this, the antagonist should just be the unforgiving environment of space, and yet it's a crispy Freddy Krueger wannabe who happens to be a religious extremist and killing everybody. God. I Hey, I agree, man. It doesn't make sense. <laughs> he, <sighs> and he didn't even write the script, either. 
<laughs> no, that was Alex Garland. <laughs> so that's what I mean. It's like, ah, oh, maybe, I don't know, maybe they ran out of money or they're like, this would be cool. Let's do this. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, but, you know, I did find something else. I found another, I mean, th- since this is a space film, it seems like all the internet pedants <laughs> want to come out and drag something about the space film. <laughs> so do you want to hear the latest edition of this week in toxic fandom oh do i <laughs> let it rip okay so this is a bit of a long one so bear with me but this is courtesy of the some of the internet pedants on imdb so okay. near the beginning of the film the ship is said to be 36 million miles from the sun the large images of the sun that the crew see are therefore obviously greatly magnified is at that distance the sun wouldn't appear that massive to the eye however that distance is closer to the sun than Mercury's average distance, so the planet should appear much larger than it is shown. However, Mercury has quite an elliptical orbit, and it's possible that at the time, Mercury may have been near its closest point to the sun, which is 28.5 million miles, or 7.5 million miles from the ship. Even so, it would still appear much larger relative to the, to the sun than it is shown when it passes in front of the sun's disk. Damn. <laughs> so while very detailed and very thorough this pan ant just saw this in the film and just had to let everybody know that this movie was just just got it wrong they they knew their space geography <laughs> they study their stellar maps <laughs> dude i got one and this is kind of interesting uh and I, it's actually kind of informative so <clears throat> what it so Sear Lay's statement about 80% of dust being human skin is commonly held but false. But a false ermine myth. Common household dust on Earth is composed of many different things, and none of them individually account for anything close to 80%. Given the situation, it's entirely possible that the dust he's looking at is mostly human skin but it's not true for dust in general. Another user said the crew of the Icarus one apparently committed mass suicide in their early mission. When they reached Mercury, dead people do not produce new skin cells. The inch thick dust over everything could never have accumulated. So when we see that dusty room at Icarus one, that was not all skin cells, nor 80% of it was skin cells because dust, isn't 80% skin. Uh, now we have dust pit ants on the internet. That's fun. <laughs> I know. I, I, I never thought dust was made up of normally mostly skin cells. So that, that was just like, what? But that's kind of funny that the movie wanted to portray it like that. I was confused with the dust. I will say that. Yeah, I mean, it would have made sense if they found, like, um, a research station in the snow, but they're in space. Yes. And there's just, like, eight inches of dust on everything. It's just... (laughs) He was like... Even I was thinking, where is all this dust coming from? (laughs) They're in space. (laughs) Exactly. That's what I thought, too. I'm like, oh, it's just been a long time. (laughs) And now that this room's been used. (laughs) But it was everywhere. The entire room was covered in... (laughs) Uh, uh, Danny Boyle, man. Sometimes he just goes yeah. too far. Yeah. So, what do you say we discuss the legacy or lack thereof of Sunshine real quick? Oh, let's do it. So, in spite of the criticisms that we've levied at it, it actually holds a pretty decent rating on Rotten Tomatoes. It has a 76% on that site, and as, as well as a 64% on Metacritic. But, again, these are internet ratings, so take it for what you will. <laughs> Uh, no major award nominations, but it was nominated for Best Science Fiction Film at the Saturn Awards. Um, and from what I was reading, a lot of the criticism seems to be levied towards that pivot that the film makes after after Pinbacker finds his way to Icarus 2. So the same criticisms that we have, everybody else seems to have. <laughs> <laughs> So, and this wasn't a box office success either. As we mentioned, it was budgeted at $40 million and only grossed $32 million at the box office. And I had to look up when this film was released in the United States because it got an April release in the UK. 
and it was released in the United States on July 20th, 2007. And that was the same weekend as Hairspray, and I now pronounce you Chuck and Larry, which are both terrible movies and are somehow worse than this. <laughs> and I don't think it's fair that the film only grossed $32 million. It should have made a bit more. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying it should have grossed hundreds of millions of dollars, but I think it could have done a lot better at the box office and should have done better than those two hunk of crap movies. Mm-hmm. But it's also been criticized by a lot of uh, astronomers in the scientific community for a lot of inaccuracies, uh, especially in regards to the idea of using a bomb to reboot the sun, because you would literally need. I don't know what you need, but it would not. You can't just throw gunpowder or a stellar bomb in hopes that the sun just restarts, because that's not going to that's not going to work. And though as well I don't it's just ridiculous to that you know a simple the idea of a stellar bomb which we they don't explain like what's in it all <laughs> Kappa says like oh it just contains all the combustible material on earth and it's a bomb the size of Manhattan like oh, okay but in theory you built two of these things like so what's the deal here I mean it doesn't surprise me that humans want to shoot things to maybe make it work so <laughs> the yeah. sun is how the else ball. are we going to test how we're, how else are we going to make sure our giant bomb works oh let's throw it at the biggest object in the universe you know i, I wouldn't put it past us so and i think area 51 you know has enough radiation to say that we've done that so we've done it before baby <laughs> um however i think given the film's nature uh, nature of the plot i don't think a sequel is ever going to happen um God. but i could see a remake happening for maybe in like another 10 years or so when enough time has passed to kind of you know forget about this film i think a remake could be possible but again eliminate the whole pinbacker subplot and just make this a a space exploration film not a, a horror movie in space I'm going to I'm going to second you on that. I think this could be a good remake in the, like another 10 15 years definitely. Stylistically it's great. Um if they just change the ending, I think they can really get it get it right. But I don't think in hindsight though people I think it will be praised in like another 10 years it'll get a lot more um better reception, you know, despite the controversial ending. I do think the graphics were ahead of its time. So I think you're right on, man. Well, let's hope so. And with all of that in mind, let's rate Sunshine, shall we? Oh, yes. So on our unique scale for the Force Fed sci-fi podcast of wouldn't watch, would watch, would own, and would host a viewing party, what do you give to this film, Sean? (laughs) Uh, What do I give to this film? I give it a solid uh, wood watch. I think it's 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 got a lot going for it visually, and especially like the special effects for the time that they came out in 07, especially 13 years later. They're great. It really is great. It's kind of like a, uh, a Jurassic Park. Mostly great, though. I will say, Pinbacker, that special effects kind of sucks. But outside of that, I mean, the the film stylistically is awesome. Definitely Danny Boyle, uh, he owns it. You know, you know, it's his film. I just think, like we talked about, the ending is pretty off-putting. I think they had a good idea, but they just didn't know how to finish it. Or maybe the writer really wanted to throw in religion for some reason because of beliefs. Who knows what happened in that writer's room? But I think it was pretty good until the end. So for me, I will definitely give it a solid wood watch. How about you? Yeah, I think this film actually does a great job of exploring the psychological toll that space travel and especially long term space travel can have on a person. And it's it's something that I think we're just beginning to understand as we're having astronauts have extended stays on the International Space Station. There are also there are very obvious overtones in regards to 
climate change and humanity's role in combating it, which helps make the film more relevant in today's world, I think. And then I really do enjoy everybody's performances and the pr- and the principal cast get a decent chance to show off their talents here. And this actually may be like it's up there in terms of my favorite cast in films that we've talked about on this show. And like you said, the special effects hold up really well after over a decade but there are obvious things that the that we can't ignore when discussing this film and sunshine borrows a lot from other great films like 2001 a space odyssey and alien as well and we've talked about it so much so far and that that hard turn towards the horror genre in the third act just totally derails the film for both of us from what we've discussed and and not fully seeing pinbacker almost makes him this invisible villain and almost laughable. And I really feel like a bit of humor might have helped the film overall. But the first hour and 15 minutes of this film is great. And it's just that pivot towards horror that derails it. But I would still call this film, I'm right with you, I would still call this a wood watch. Awesome. <laughs> I don't know. And we could take some consolidation that because of this film, he went off to make Slumdog Billionaire which ended up being a great film. <laughs> if that third act gets retooled and we don't see a pinbacker and I think this could have been a much better film, but it, it, it was written and it turned out the way it did. So again, that first hour and 15 minutes is solid and it's a, it's a great mm-hmm. film, but then it's just that hard left turn that can't be ignored. Right. <laughs> if they would have fixed that ending, this would have been a host of viewing party for sure. I would say. Yeah. But oh so, well. On to the next one. I think <laughs> Yes. We're gonna enlist the help of our friendly random number generator AI, Major Samantha, to help us select from our list of one hundred and eighteen films for our next episode. And let's see. And from that list she has selected number one hundred four. It is a film from nineteen seventy six, directed by Michael Anderson. It is Logan's Run. Ooh, I've heard of this film. All right. I've heard of it. I have I have never seen it, so I am definitely going to be looking forward to watching that. Oh, man. A 70s film about space sci-fi? I can't <laughs> wait, man. <laughs> yeah, we haven't been into the into the 70s for a while, so it'll be interesting to kind of go back there yeah, right. <laughs> and revisit that that era of filmmaking. Oh, the best well sweet man <laughs> it's always a pleasure chris i appreciate you uh, likewise likewise my friend and if you all enjoyed today's episode please please head on over to apple Podcasts and leave us a five-star review it really helps to drive us up the charts as well as help people like you find the show we are across the spectrum of social media with facebook twitter and instagram all at force fed sci-fi You can check out and download episodes from Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, the iHeartRadio app, or wherever you find podcasts. And please hit that subscribe button so you never miss an episode. Finally, you can check out our website, forcefedsci-fi.com, for show notes and links to all of our social media. So for all of us at the ForceFed Sci-Fi team, we will see you next time. Force Fed Sci-Fi is written and hosted by Sean Culp and Chris Rupp. Website design, associate producer, and editing by Jeremy Kesky. Artwork designed by Mike Berger. Theme music composed and performed by Custom Anthem.